Good evening. My name is Aaron Howard. I'm the servant of God and the minister for the church in Tennessee Ministries. Back with another episode, another lesson from the Bible. Uh, today's lesson is on love. I started last week on that. I meant to get to it Sunday. I actually meant to do uh, a video actually in between the week. I just couldn't get to it. it was way too busy at the time. Excuse me. So last week we talked about or we did a background reference to have a uh, the set of circumstances surrounding what Jesus was talking about. And we're going to go over that and expound on that right now. One second here. All right. So the scripture we're on is 1 John 3, 1 through 16. And in this scripture, we're going to expound on love in this particular context and how it relates to what Christ, what the Father is talking about and who it's referring to. That way, when we utilize that scripture in our life, we can utilize it and apply it in the same exact fashion as it's being applied uh, in the scriptures. When we think about that verse, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever should believe it, shall believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's probably one of the most famous verses there is, and one of the most talked about, one of the most, maybe one of the most taught verses there is, certainly one of the most spoken verses there is, or passages of verse, verses anywhere. But I also think it's misunderstood. I also think we don't have a clear understanding of what's being referred to. So we're going to go into that and, and go through the scripture concerning that. So when last we spoke, the background here is Nicodemus came to Christ by night. <clears throat> Whatever reason, uh, maybe he wanted to make sure he didn't have any falling out with his sect, the Pharisees. You had three sects, the Ascendants, the Pharisees, and another one that I, I can't think of right now, and they all had sort of different understanding of the doctrine, okay? So he came to Jesus by, by night, and Christ is teaching, is using this as a teaching moment to some degree as he's talking to Nicodemus. He tells Nicodemus, you're not going to really be able to see the kingdom of God unless you've been born again. And that goes for anybody else. You have to have a birth from above. You have, you have to, the, the word has to be spoken into your life. This is not about rituals and customs. It's not about water baptism. It's not about walking an aisle to accept Christ. This is about a work that happens between the individual and God through his son, Jesus Christ. Okay. Nicodemus says, can I go back a second time into my mother's womb? Nicodemus no, you can't go back a second time into your mother's womb. Okay? Christ said, the wind bloweth where it listed. You hear the sound there, but you can't tell from whence it came, where it goes. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. All right? So now we get to verse... We're in verse... Give me a second here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Verse, we went through 14, verse 15, I'm starting at 14, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, Moses, whosoever believed on that serpent and looked at the serpent would live, would survive the plague of the fiery serpents that, that God brought into the camp because of the unbelief and the murmuring and complaining of the mixed multitude that he had brought out from Egypt. And sometimes that's what we do as believers. We're brought out from, we forget where we came from. We forget the pork and beans and, 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 and little Vienna sausages and, and we forget the hog head cheese that we were eating. We forget that one bedroom apartment we were staying in with mama when uh, the heat wasn't working. We forget all of the, the trials and tribulations we went through early on. And then God starts to bring us out of that, that part of the wilderness. <clears throat> he starts to bless us with certain things, even though the true blessing is to be well off in spite of one's circumstances. 
And then all of a sudden we start forgetting about them. We start murmuring and complaining about small things, little things. All right, he didn't, he didn't mow the lawn right. Heck, I need to show them all the money I'm giving. All sorts of things we start murmuring and complaining about. What we eating today? I ain't nothing to eat but pantries full of food, refrigerators full of food. You just don't feel like cooking. Man, ain't nothing in the house. Right? Oh man, I need a new car. You just got a car two years ago. I need another one. So these things uh, we murmur and complain about. And that's similar to the children of Israel, the mixed multitude that was coming out of Egypt. They started murmuring, complaining, murmuring, complaining about uh, we when we were back in Egypt, we had these leeks to eat, and now we don't have any. <coughs> Excuse me. Now we're not eating how we were eating in Egypt. Uh, you forgot about the the turmoil that you were going through in Egypt and all the hard bondage that Pharaoh was putting you through. Okay, so. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up the same way that Moses was able to use the serpent to lift the plague off the people then is the same way Christ is going to be similar to that serpent and he's going to lift the plague off of his people. His people. His people. Okay? That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world, okay? For God so loved the world. Let's look at this so we can understand it. We're at John 3, 16. All right. For God so so loved the Let's look at this first. God so loved the world, right? Previous verse, Son of man should be lifted up that whosoever believeth him should not perish but have eternal life. Because, for, that's the word God, for, that's the word God, simply means because. Because God, the word God is the word theos, deity. All right. Now listen. It's just a translation, folks. Don't flip out because they translated it into English. If I was reading a Spanish book, I would like it translated thoroughly so I can see what everything means, so I can get a clear understanding of what I'm reading, especially if it's something that I'm going to have to do. The believers back then that were Gentile needed a translation. The translation for, for God, the translation for Theos is the word God. They translated it from the, the Hebrew word Elohim, probably, or one of the other words, Yeshua. Uh, there's quite a few words for the word God that I'm not going to get into. And God is a title. That's not his name. Just like, for instance, the office of the president, presidency. The term president is a title. It's a title to an office. There are many people that have held that office that have had the, held that title, Trump right now, uh, the Bushes, Clinton, Nixon, Lyndon B. Johnson, so on and so forth, right? There are many people that held that title. That wasn't their name. That was just the title for the office they held. God is just a title for, for the office that the supreme being holds. 
That's what they translated it into English, God. There are three that hold that office. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. That term God, that's just one. It's just the office. Three hold the office. All right? Theos. Did. For God so. So is an important word. So. Oitas. In this way, which proceeds or follows. All right. In the way that proceeds or follows. In this way, in this manner, right? For God in this manner loved the world. Not in any manner. I need you to job, do the job. I want you to do the job in this way. There's a particular way that I want you to do this job. There's a particular way that God is showing love to the world. And we're going to get to that because this world word is equally important as, as the rest of it. Maybe more so to understanding what this verse is talking about. All right. So he so loved the world. In this fashion, he, in this manner, he loved the world. The word love. Let's go over here. The word love. Agapetos. Agapetos. All right. It means to love, and when you look this up, you, you go to a strong Greek, uh, strong Greek and Hebrew concordance. It'll give you an elementary, uh, an elementary definition for the word. Elementary, just a, a real simple principle. First, second, third, fourth grade definition for it. Nothing real in depth. To love in a social. Or moral sense, right? Now let's stop there for a second. Now we know that the English translation is the word, the English, not translation, the English definition for love is affection. It could be romance, they have great fondness for it, have affection for it to like. Is that what this is talking about here? So is an adverb. Okay. Adverb modify other words or other word phrases. They modify nouns. They modify verbs. They modify adjectives. So they modify. They give a, a picture or they give a they give a clear understanding of how you need to understand the words you're looking at or the verb or the noun. So he so loved the world. This, in this context, you can clearly see is applicable in a moral sense. Why in a moral sense? Because that's part of God's nature, right? So when we see this, do we believe that it's referring to affection for the world? Do we believe that? A lot of people do. A lot of people believe that God has great affection for all of humanity. What we're going to do is go through the scripture so we can understand what this means in context. Okay? Does this word mean that he has affection for the world? All right. So let's look. Let's look at it. Because I submit to you, when we look at scripture, and, and don't do this. Don't take scripture to fight scripture. If you're having a debate or you're having a, a civil argument or you're trying to get an understanding of scripture with someone else, don't take the scripture to fight against other scripture. You take the scripture to understand scripture. Okay? 
we compare spiritual things to spiritual things. Why? So we can get an understanding. So the scripture can set a precedent on how it needs to be understood, how you need to look at it. Hold on. Let's go to where that scripture is. Give me a second. We compare spiritual things with spiritual. I can't remember. I think it's in Corinthians. Spiritual with spiritual. Right? Got my cheat sheet here. First, First Corinthians 2.13. 1 Corinthians 2.13 Verse 12 Now we have received not the spirit of the world but the spirit which is of God now we have received not the spirit of the world now we have received not the spirit of we were already born with that sort of spirit we've been given a new spirit now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, the spirit of truth. For when the spirit of truth is come, he shall guide you in all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear from God, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Which man, which Man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. We compare verse with verse so we can understand. The word is spiritual. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God, and the word was God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made which was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Okay? There's going to be any light inside of man. It's going to come from Christ. Okay. So, don't argue with someone. Don't use scripture to fight another scripture. Use scripture to understand scripture. That's what we do. All right. So, what we're going to do is go through the scriptures to, to see if God has affection for the world. All right. Let's go to 1 John 2.16. 1 John 2.16. All right. In 1 John 2.16. 2.15 through 2.16. God's thoughts on the world. Right? First John 2.16 It says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world it's the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. The lust of the flesh. The lust of the eyes. And the pride of life. I'll have that if I want to. i get that if I want to. Can't tell me what to do. All things are lawful for me to get. Paul says all things are inexpedient, though. All things don't benefit you. All right. Galatians well, let's go to 1 John 5.19. 1 John 5.19. And we know that we are of God, talking about believers. 5.19. And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lies in wickedness. These scriptures set a precedent. What they do is they set an understanding, a rule for how you need to look at subject matter that this may contradict. This establishes how you need to look at how God looks at the world. Okay? Galatians 1 and 4. Galatians 1 and 4. Verse 1. 
Verse 3, grace be to you and peace from God, for the sins of the believer, for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world. That's even back then. It's getting worse and worse as we keep going further and further in time. He gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. All right? So that's Galatians 1 and 4. There's a theme that we're seeing here. Can't possibly mean affection. Can't possibly mean affection. James 4 and 4. James 4 and 4. Verse 1. From whence come wars and fightings among you, speaking to the church? Come they not hence even of your lust that warn your members? Ye lust and have not. You kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight war, yet ye have not because you ask not. You ask, you ask and receive not because you ask amiss. You miss the mark when you're asking, uh, when you're asking of God for something. And you miss the mark because you want to consume it upon your lust, whatever you're asking God for. You adulterers and adulteresses. An adulterer and an adulteress was someone that was married and was cheating on their husband or wife with another married person. Specifically speaking, fornication was just having sex outside of that marriage or just having sex uh, out, having sex with another person outside of your marriage or just having sex while not being in a marriage, in a monogamous heterosexual relationship. All right. That continued. You adulterers and adulterers, you adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God. Who, whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is God's enemy. To be affectionate with those that are opposed to God. That's what it's talking about. It's not now the opposite of that is not to hate the world. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about just showing great affection for something that you know is opposed to God. That's what it's talking about. It's not talking about hating anyone. That's not the opposite here. Okay? So we're going to put that down. James. Four. And four, all right? We're establishing the theme that when God says he so loved the world, it's not, it has nothing to do with affection for the world, all right? It has to do with the nature of who he is and to do what is right by all of mankind. Do what is expressly right for the creation that he put here. The opportunity for life, life more abundantly life eternal, okay? This word is talking about his care for the creation, his desire to see their well-being. I care for them in this fashion. It's not talking about having an affection for all the evil things that is going on in the world. Absolutely not. Let's go to, uh, I'm almost, my time is almost up. Let's go to God's thoughts towards those Committing evil. There's no way he's talking about affection. 
And these verses bear that out. And so this is not about fighting verse with verse. This is about getting an understanding of how we need to look at this verse in light of this information. All right. Psalms 5 and 5. Psalms 5 and 5. Verse 4, for thou art not a God that hath pleasure in wickedness, neither shall evil dwell with thee. The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou hatest all workers of iniquity. That word hate in that verse means to detest. As a thought, not per se as a feeling. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. When we're talking about the Father which sits in heaven, we're not talking about an emotion or feeling. We're talking about that which he disdains as a thought. Because a thought is not a feeling. Thought, not per se, an emotion. Thought, emotions and feelings, feelings are flesh. An emotion, I guess you could say a thought. Right? But this is about how he views evil. We see Psalms 5 and 5. Psalms 10 and 3. The wicked in his pride doth persecute the poor. I wonder if that's happening right now. Are the poor being persecuted right now? Are the downtrodden being persecuted right now? Are they being oppressed right now? Right now. Right now as, as I'm speaking to you. All these things are happening right now. And it's happening by wicked men in high places. <clears throat> the wicked in his pride doth persecute the poor. Let them be taken in the devices that they have imagined. For the wicked boasteth of his heart's desire and blesseth his covetous whom the Lord abhorreth. Abhor means to detest. Means to hate. Psalms 10 and 3. We're going to finish this, these few verses, and come back next week. Uh, Leviticus 20 and 23. Now remember, I am in the Old Testament. you got to remember something. All scripture is profitable if used profitably. Scripture is also profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for instructions in the way of life. 20 and 23. You shall therefore keep, I'm going to start at verse 22. You shall therefore keep all my statutes and all my judgments and do them. That the land where I bring you to dwell therein spew you not out. And you shall not walk in the manners of the nations which I cast out before you. For they committed all these things, and therefore I abhorred them. That's Leviticus. Leviticus 20 and 23. In the Greek customs and culture, Theos was the god for the deity. They, they had a poly, polytheistic <clears throat> religion. They believed in all the gods. If you go over to Acts 17th chapter where, where Paul is preaching, I believe that's Mars Hill where he's preaching, and he's preaching to, I can't remember exactly who he's preaching to right now, but that's in the 17th chapter of Acts, and they had a, they had a, a, a altar, I believe. And it said, to the unknown God. And Paul says, him declare I unto you. Alright. Right now, we're sort of living in that same sort of system. Polytheism. And even though Israel 
during their time worshipped and, and bowed down to images and the host of heaven. That was against the instruction that they were given. And that's what we have to remember. Biblically, they were told not to worship any idols. Like they didn't even have days for the week. Those came from, from out of uh, uh, Scandinavia. Uh, what's the, I can't think of the name right now. But uh, those came from Scandinavian, not Scandinavian language. I can't think of it right now. But those represented, uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, those represented the uh, pagan deities. They didn't come out the Jewish culture. They were explicitly told not to, not to worship the host of heaven, not to serve what they see. That's what idolatry means. It's the word idololatro. It'll, it'll, it means to serve what you see. All right? And that's what Leviticus is talking about here. Not to walk in the manners of the nations which I cast out before thee. So if that's a reference to us as believers, we're not supposed to be walking in the manners as those around us that are that are equivalent to being Gentiles or that are Gentiles unbelievers. We're not, we're not supposed to be walking in that way. Now, over the course of time, we learn not to walk in that way. But that doesn't that doesn't um, prevent the fact that we're still instructed not to. And then Proverbs 6, 16 through 19. Proverbs 6, 16 through 19. These six things doth the Lord hate. Seven are an abomination unto him. Proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift and running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. These are all the things that the unbeliever and some believers do. These are all the things that humanity is involved in. And God is called, telling the believer, he's calling us out of that. He's calling us out of darkness to walk in his marvelous light. Until next time, please be safe. Watch your surroundings. Be harmless as a serpent, yet wise as a dove. Guard your heart with all diligence. Out of it comes the issues of life. Protect yourself at all times. Please be careful while you're out there. If you're married, if you have females in your family, please tell them to watch their surroundings. I just saw a scary video where they where they were able to, to, to accost this woman in her car and drive off in her car. She never saw it coming. While she was putting groceries in her car, they were surrounding her like a pack of wolves, positioning themselves, watching out. It was about four of them. So please, and, and men too, be careful. Watch your surroundings. You know, one day you're here, the next day you're gone. And that's because we're, we're inadvertent. We inadvertently, I don't even think it's inadvertently. We're just not paying, we're not paying close enough attention to our surroundings. We're not paying close enough attention to our loved ones. Go the extra mile. Thank you guys for watching. Until next time, peace. May you have a, a wonderful day, a wonderful night, a wonderful week, and stay blessed. Thank you.